ISO 27001, Annex A, 8.12, Data Leakage Prevention. Okay, so often referred to as DLP. This is where the standard is moving, again, a little bit more into implementation rather than guidance. There's a few things for us to consider here. Um, it's pushing us down a tool, ultimately, uh, a DLP, a data leakage prevention tool. But let's have a look at what the standard says, and then I'll give you some tips and some techniques around it and how we can implement that. So the definition of Annex A 8.12, data leakage prevention. Data leakage prevention measures should be applied to systems, networks, and any other devices that process, store, or transmit sensitive information. So what we're looking at here is we know that data can escape our environment. It can escape outside of our control. Um, in a diverse technological setup, you know, there are many areas where people can get information out here. It's really targeting people taking information that they shouldn't. And it's really forcing us again down some technical controls and a technical implementation, which I kind of feel a little bit uncomfortable with. I understand where it's coming from and I know why it's doing it. So what are the areas where people can get information out? Okay, things that you might want to consider. We want to stop people getting information out of systems, out of devices. We want to prevent them from doing things like, you know, you may have an environment where uh, it is important uh, that people aren't able to record a screen, right? So we see this a lot in financial institutions, in financial organizations. This relies more on administrative control, right? Preventing people from recording or photographing screens. That's one of the areas that you can consider whether or not you want to have floors where people can't take these mobile devices on there and therefore can't get the information out. We have the ability for data to leak through data backup. Uh, and we're going to touch on that in the next control when we look at data backups. Um, so considerations around encrypting backups and the kind of backup technology that you use. Very rarely these days that people are using things like tapes and storage media. More often than not, people are putting backups into the cloud, which is the right thing to do, and activating encryption on that to prevent that data leakage uh, from happening. We've got other control areas uh, that we've looked at when we've looked at physical security, things like our printers and our fax machines and putting some controls in around that to prevent this data from being accessed. And we put things in around uh, clear desk um, and making sure that confidential and sensitive data isn't on there. There are some old school things that you can look at here in terms of locking down of devices. So we've looked at configuration and management. We've looked at the removal of um, system services, ports that we don't need. Here, traditionally, we see people locking down USB or uh, connecting uh, ports so that people can't plug in uh, and then managing that through business risk and business need and then authorizing access to that rather than it being the default. You know, the ability for somebody to plug in a USB or equivalent device uh, and harvest data is a very real one and it's been happening for a long time. People plugging in key loggers into the back of uh, keyboards and in back of devices uh, and extracting data in that way. So there are a lot of like old school, I guess, um, techniques that you can deploy here to help you with relatively low hanging fruit. A lot of the uh, management systems and you know Microsoft will have the ability to do that uh, built into them. So it's quick, easy win. And there are some administrative things that we can do. What we're also going to do is we're going to implement our culture of training and awareness, our information security culture, and we're going to be communicating to people around our policies um, and what it is that we expect of them. And we're going to be through training, showing them, um, you know, the, the downsides uh, of when uh, data leakage can occur uh, and common things that we expect of them. So let's get to the nitty gritty of what this wants. What this really wants is a tool. It's pushing you down a tool. It's going to expect you to have a tool, some kind of a DLP tool. And I'm not comfortable with that, but that is the case. And there are often clients that I have where we will manage it through risk management with the compensating controls that we've gone through. And we will put it on our risk register and accept the risk of not having a DLP tool because the cost of having a tool, the administrative overhead of having a tool far outweighs our risk exposure. Now, this is case by case, right? This is case by case. So you're going to do what's right for you. You're going to engage with a legal professional. You're going to talk to your legal counsel and understand that if you go down a DLP route, what it is that you can and can't do. You know, a DLP tool is going to have access to pretty much everything. It's going to have access because it has to, to be able to analyze it and to put those rules and controls in place. 
So you're going to understand from a legal standpoint where you stand. Uh, you're going to engage with a, an IT professional who is going to help you implement best in class uh, tools and technologies into your organization. But obviously that's going to come with an overhead of somebody needs to manage it, somebody needs to be trained in it and you know all, all the overheads that, that go along, uh, along with that. We're going to look at having our DLP system operating and there's some consideration. So let's go through them, right? A data leakage prevention tool is designed to track, detect and protect information based on rules using technology. So how you go about that, put some real thought into the project and the implementation and the steps that you're going to take when you implement that. Don't just put it in and put it at the highest level and prevent people doing their work day one, right? You're going to have to have a phased approach to this. There's going to be learnings that you're going to learn about how the tool works and how you operate and what the tool throws out in terms of false positives and how you can get the best control from that. These can be applied to structured and unstructured data, so you're going to consider that, and they can detect or prevent disclosure of sensitive data, for example, sending information to or from personal and cloud emails and sending it to cloud storage devices. So there's some like no-brainers there, right? I mean, we don't want people sending Gmail, Hotmail, Yahoo Mail, whatever. We don't want people emailing information outside the organization. It may be the case that you can uh, implement something around that using your email technology, right? It doesn't necessarily have to be the DLP tool itself. So we're thinking about a nuanced approach here. If the tool is right, the tool is right, but there may be some things that we can do. We said it already, a more traditional example of data leakage is preventing uh, the use of attached media, external drives, USB devices, restrictions on printing. We've touched that. Implementing a DL2, DLP tool takes planning and it can be easy, easy to implement tools that prevent people from doing their job, right? I mean, you could put these tools in and create all kinds of headaches for yourself. So you're going to have to spend time understanding what people need to do, how they need to do it and how your tool can support that, how it can manage risk but not prevent people from doing uh, their work. So a good approach to implementing it would be implement it in monitoring mode. You know, have a look and analyze the results before turning on those restrictive controls. The ability to request access to appeal a block control will help maintain smooth operation. So having that process built in either into your help desk or whatever process that you've got where people can say, actually, no, I need to be able to do something, right? We're not information security prevention, right? We're not preventing people doing their job. We're helping them do their job in a risk-based, secure way. So we want to give that route, that ability for people to request access to do what it is that they need to do. Some things that cannot be covered by DLP tools, screenshots, use of cameras, video stream, stream, streaming of screens, you know, and again, we're going to look at conditions of employment, we're going to look at policies, we're going to look at training and education, and we're going to look at physical controls such as not allowing those cameras into the work environment. So there's a lot that goes into the DLP. Think about where you're at, think about what the risk is, think about whether or not some basic controls, technical controls around email and email management are sufficient, whether or not you're going to put in allow listing of websites, which is a control we'll come on to that prevents people from accessing websites and uh, that can cause issue or, you know, that prevents people from accessing, you know, Dropbox equivalents, you know, personal email equivalents, personal storage equivalents. There's some good quick controls that you can put in there. It may be in the tools that you've got already that you can lock down ports uh, and you can lock down services to prevent that. And obviously backing that with training and awareness and education, the policies that you've got will, will go a long way to supporting you as well. Your job is not to prevent people from doing their job, right? That is not your job. Your job is to secure the environment, understand the risk of DLP, and if it's appropriate for you to put the right controls in place. Seek the help of a legal professional, seek the help of your technology specialists, your IT teams to help you understand how far this can go and then back that up with the documentation through risk management, have it on your risk register, have your compensating controls on there, document exactly what it is that you're doing, be able to evidence that documentation, the techniques that you've deployed, be able to show that through internal audit and ongoing checking that you're checking it, have those routes out for people to be able to request to be able to do things that they need to do. Keep records of that so that you have records of exception where you are allowing people to do things and take it in a, in a phased step-by-step -step approach so that you do not bring the organization to its knees day one, okay? 
you're going to be absolutely golden. My name is Stuart Barker, the ISO 27001 Ninja. And until the next tutorial, peace out. Thank <laughs> you.